So I'm while I'm screwing all this green board. So to be clear, green board is a gypsum product, which is impregnated with a um, chemical in it that resists mold and mildew. And I have been using that for years and years. There have been times where I've used Duroc, where I've used Hardy Backer, where I've used other type of backer boards. Um, the one I like the best out of all of them is a product that's kind of hard to come by in Atlanta. Um, well, there actually there are a couple. Triton is the last one that I worked with, and I love it. Uh, Triton is um, a backer board that's easy to score and snap. It's easy to shave off. It does all the things that I want a backer board to do as opposed to the cement boards. So it's a composite product. Um, Triton is not easy to come by, and it's obviously pricier. There are other uh, backer boards out there, the foam products that I work with from time to time. Um, a lot of times with the backer board specifically, it is what my customer wants rather than what I choose. Um, I choose green board by default because at the end of the day, we're waterproofing no matter what backer board we're using, unless, of course, it's a foam board. Um, there is a mantra about not using a gypsum product in a wet area. And I want to talk about that just for a second while you're watching all this transpire. If, uh, well, so having been in the apartment business uh, for many years back in the early to mid 90s, when tile start falling off of the wall is when we get a work order. And the tiles start falling off the wall because you have uh, the shower valves, which were two handle, hot and cold, they have packing which goes bad and the packing sprays behind the wall into the wall board and it it ruins the sheetrock which is typically what's up there and then you have builders grade 4x4 uh, tile with uh, unsanded grout so that's the reason why uh, walls fail with gypsum in a wet area in a tub they don't fail in showers in fact gypsum was used in showers for many many years from you know say about mm, late 70s 80s into the 90s um, in showers and I take those out on a frequent basis and I've never run into any problems I've, in fact I've never even been called on a shower that's failed because specifically they use gypsum it's just never happened usually that only happens on a tub and it only happens because of the seats and the washers and the packing that had to do with the old type of shower valves, which we're not using anymore either. So for that reason alone, um, I'm very comfortable using Greenboard. That it has a mold and mildew inhibitor is why I choose that over normal sheetrock. So that's my take on that. Any other backer board, Triton, um, a lot of backer boards out there that would still need to be waterproofed. If you use Hardy Backer, yes, you're waterproofing. If you use Durarock, Yes, you're, you're still waterproofing. If you use 8-inch cinder block and filled all those holes in with concrete, you're still waterproofing at the end of the day. And so that's why I feel like no matter what backer board, if I had half-inch rigid cardboard, I'm very comfortable building a shower out of cardboard and then waterproofing it. And so that's kind of my take on, um, on the backer board that I'm using. I wanted to kind of go through that because a lot of people freak out when they see my videos and they see that I'm using green board and they're like, oh no, no, that's a that's a no, no, you shouldn't be using gypsum product in a shower. And yes, if there was ever a failure of a shower, specifically because they use gypsum instead of a cement board, then I would be all on board with that. Um, going forward with waterproofing, it's, it doesn't really matter. The board is up there to hold the tile, period. Anyway, moving on, you see I just used my uh, oscillating tool 
to cut that hole for my uh, shower valve. Oscillating tool is awesome. It should be an awesome tool. They should just rename it the awesome tool. Um, I do so much of my work with that oscillating tool, and by default, I used to call it a Dremel. Um, but in fact, there are different brand names that have that. And you know, undercutting of your door jam, you know, cutting holes in whatever backer board you're using. Um, I mean, there's just so it's so much multifunctional that I I can't even imagine working without it. Anyway, getting back to the backer board, I want to talk about this for a minute too. I'm using normal sheetrock inch and a quarter screws. And again, if you're using a backer board, um, specifically say uh, Hardy Backer, they have their proprietary school, uh, screws, which um, are coated that they don't rust. My take on it is if you anticipate that your screws are going to get rusted behind your waterproofer, you've already failed the shower. So yes, I've taken out many a shower with rusted screws that were not waterproofed. And that's the caveat to how I kind of, you know, there's a lot of common sense that goes into how I build a shower. There's also uh, mitigation to failure, right? And so if there were failures with regard to what I'm doing here, I would mitigate those. In fact, raising my wallboard, as you see there, about an inch or so off of the shower pan floor is the way that I mitigate failures. Because as all tilers know, people who do bathrooms and shower renovations, almost all of our failures, I'm going to say 98% of the failures happen at the curb. Left and right of the curb where those, those vertical studs that you see on the left and right get rotted out and the curb itself sometimes get rotted out. By raising your backer board off of the floor by that one inch, all four sides around, you stop the issue of ever happening with wicking. So never have your backer board inside of the pan for sure, but also raise your wall board. Because the only way that water is going to get through into your curb or into your studs, the vertical studs, is if there is some type of wicking action going on. That wicking transfers through your backer board into those studs and then it takes years and years for those studs to get saturated to the point where they're just rotted out and then it also transfers to your floor the outside floor and then you have a bigger issue with your subfloor being rotted out that happens specifically because of the wicking action that goes on in showers so yes I make sure that I mitigate all the issues that I see when I tear showers out um, I think it's a, I think it's um, extremely important to when you take showers out, which all tile guys are, if you're building showers, and you see the failures, and you understand why it failed, and you mitigate those issues, then you're good to go. You know, this is my particular way. There's probably, you know, as many tilers as there are. There's that many ways to build a shower, and because we all know where points of failure are at. As I said, the A number one place is the curb. The curb always gets the damage first. And as I said, those are adjoining vertical studs uh, that match up to the curb. Second place, knee wall. Why? Because your knee wall is, oh, let me talk about this for a minute. I'm cutting into that tape in the corners of the existing sheetrock so that they match up to my, my new sheetrock. And there's my Dremel at work again. I just love that thing oscillating tool as it were so I'm cutting out uh, the backer for the niche that I've already measured out you see the pencil marks there so I'm usually building my niches about well I'm usually doing it on the back wall the long wall in this case he wanted it on on the rear wall and so yeah but I'm usually building them about 12 inches but I'm putting my studs in there at a 17 inch mark to get my 12 because um, the stud, the top and the bottom stud that I'm putting in there horizontally at 17 inches, by the time I put backer board, tile, thin set, all that stuff, comes out to about 12 and some change, about 12 inches or so. And I'm usually doing, as I said, on the back wall about um, 
more or less about 28, 29 inches. It's 36 inches between the studs on the back wall, but again, by the time you build everything out, it's not 36 anymore. It's usually about 28, 29 finished product, so about 12 by 29, and this one's a little bit shorter than that, obviously. Um, what was I saying before I so rudely interrupted myself? I don't remember now. It had something to do with waterproofing. Anyway, um, there's a product out there called Dent Shield. Dent Shield is a gypsum product that is waterproofed at the factory. And I love Dent Shield. On the few occasions that I've been able to work with it, it's very difficult to find and it is kind of pricey. Um, but it's pre waterproofed and it works in the same way as sheetrock because it's basically a gypsum product. So I am creating basically Dent Shield when I'm using gypsum and then I waterproof it. Then I have created Dent Shield. Um, this is, I think this is construction adhesive, but you, any caulking will do. And that's what I do. I just cut out the backboard that I need to go inside of a niche and I just glue it in there. And obviously shaving off the edges that the Dremel doesn't quite fit on. Then I go forward with the top bottom and left and right pieces. And then I mud all that stuff to make it, you know, kind of contiguous. <clears throat> anyway, getting back to the Dent Shield. Dent Shield, um, again, is a gypsum product. Um, the backer board I talked about earlier, Triton, acts a lot like gypsum, where you saw me take the razor knife and shave those pieces of, um, of uh, sheetrock down. Triton works the same way. I can shave it down. And if you've ever tried to shave a cement product, like especially with Hardy Backer, you are not going to shave it successfully with a razor knife. Um, you'll probably go through 15 blades trying to get one side shaved. And that's why I always prefer one of these type of products rather than a cement product. Um, if I were to do... If, if on a tub, and I talked about it earlier, if on a tub I were using a backer board like this, I would not have it setting on the edge of the tub. I would have it setting on the lip. That way there's not water penetration that's going on. That's the only time that I found failures on wall board, as I said earlier, on tubs. Because people have a tendency of setting it on the edge of the tub right down there where water can wick in through the caulking eventually and wick up the backer board. If you set it on the lip of the tub, you're good to go. And for that reason, I wouldn't use a cement product even on a tub shower combo. Uh, going through this process, this is a long series. <laughs> As you've already seen, there's already been a couple of videos that I've posted and I'm gonna put together um, all three of these 30-minute videos and make one very, very long video um, about how to build this shower. So this is a, a cement board. Yes, it's Durarock. And yes, I use Durarock on my horizontal surfaces. So if I have a bench, if I have a knee wall, or if I have a curb, which I always do, then I'm yes, I'm using a cement board. Well, why, Bob? Why aren't you using gypsum board on a horizontal surface. Mm -hmm. I just feel better about using it, um, a cement product, as it were, um, on these surfaces. And yes, even though it's going to get red guarded, and yes, even though I'm confident that no water will ever penetrate through, eh, like I said, eh, old habits are hard to break, and so I'm just more confident using um, cement product. So I use that on the curb, on the front, on the inside, and on the top. And when I'm finished with that, um, and you'll see momentarily when I'm finished with that, I use some thin set and I, and I butter that curb just like I would a cake. Like literally, I just wrap the whole thing. And so all of those punctures that you see, let me talk about that too. I think that's a very important uh, point to hit on. The puncturing of the curb material, as it were, the um, pan liner, right? 
you saw where I screwed in all my backer board into that curb. And yes, I am puncturing into the pan liner that I wrapped it around. Seems counterintuitive to do that, right? If you're relying solely on the curb itself to be your waterproofer, but I'm not, right? So by buttering the entirety of the curb and, you know, just making it like one monolithic piece, then I waterproof it and therefore I don't have to worry about the curb ever, ever seeing water. Plus it can't wick up water because the inside of the curb is also raised that one inch I was talking about on the other three walls. So water cannot get without, right? It can't get within because I'm waterproofing it and it can't get without, meaning into the adjoining studs or anything because I'm waterproofing it. So I'm not really worried about that. Also, I wanted to mention um, there is a, and I, I'm using the, the term lightly, uh, dam corners. Sometimes people call a curb a dam. So those are basically PVC, pieces of PVC liners that are kind of fashioned to wrap around the curb. Some guys use them on the inside of the curb uh, and they wrap around to the front and then some guys use them on the outside as well. So they'll use two pieces of those dam corners on the left and the right. Here's my take on that. If you, um, if you are not confident that your shower is waterproof from without, in other words, on the outside of everything that you haven't waterproofed correctly and you need dam corners, and water ever sees those damn corners, you fail the shower. You have failed the shower if those damn corners ever kick in. That's my take on it. Because as you already saw, my curb is already wrapped, my walls are already wrapped. Um, so those, those areas that we're concerned about, which is correct, it would be the left and right of the curb. But those damn corners are there to mitigate the issues that, that we run into when we see wood rot means that water has penetrated through your curve for some reason and therefore the dam corners would now kick in and kind of shed off any moisture or water that got into them but you failed it already yeah you failed it it's almost like I'm a horrible driver so I need an airbag just in case and I I don't know you know like I said I have a different mindset you know a lot of this is common sense um, rather than reading by, you know, books and manuals and stuff like that. Because on the OJT, on-job training, you know, when you take out showers and you find out how they fail, as I said before, you mitigate the issues, and that's what I do. Um, people ask me sometimes, so if you use gypsum product on your walls, do you use thin set for all of this mudding, or do you use sheetrock mud? And my take on it is if my customer wants a gypsum, sorry, if my customer wants a cement product, then I use thin set to do all of this. If I'm using grain board, which I am here, then I'm using sheetrock mud. And so then it's argued, well, why aren't you taping all those seams before you put the mud on? <sighs> Tape is a crack preventer. If this was just three walls, right? and we weren't tiling it. It was just three normal walls. Yes, I would be using tape because the tape prevents the cracking from happening from movement of the two different planes, right? So the tape would be a mitigation effect for the cracking. Red Guard, Aqua Bat, uh, sorry, Aqua Defense, Hydro Band, 8 plus 9, all of those liquid topical, topical membranes are a crack preventer already. So if I were to use tape at all these seams, thinking that that will prevent the cracking, but yet I'm using a crack preventer, it's a little bit of a redundancy that doesn't really matter. I've had customers ask me, you know, well, I know you don't use tape, but can you use tape for me? I'm like, sure, I'll use the tape if it makes you feel better. But that's all it is. It just makes you feel better. Once I have red guarded, once I have put any waterproofer on top of all of this area, that prevents any cracking from ever happening. And if the cracking is so profound that it is transferring to your tile on a wall, yeah, you got bigger issues. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just putting on all of this sheetrock mud. 
and no I don't use corner bead on a shower it's kind of ridiculous to to have that going on the corner bead is a protector of the corners and since I'm wrapping my corners with a tile anyway and or I'm using a Schluter product on on the end of it then it's kind of doesn't make any sense plus if you use corner bead you have to feather out your mud you know probably eight nine ten inches um, so that bumps out your wall as opposed to the other flatness and all that stuff of the rest of the wall so what I do typically I'll put on one coat and I'll get it as good as possible like I'm doing here I'm just getting off all this boogering the next day I come in there and I sand off all the discrepancies or if I have any type of feathering I have to do you see I think on the top there you see that feathering I had to do to get it flat once I've sanded that off I'll put on a second coat typically I'll put a fan on it do other things and then you know within a few hours I can uh, sand that off and get it nice and smooth and flat a lot of this um, that I'm doing is a little bit little bit of overkill um, meaning that because I'm red guarding and because you know tile and thin set and all that stuff is going to go on it anyway does it have to be all smooth and pretty and perfect no but I have the time to kill as I'm doing all of this work and because I have the time to kill and I know I'm going to be following it with tile I want all of this prep as good as possible what you saw earlier or maybe you didn't see earlier in my previous video where I'm doing all the prep I'm putting all the wood product I'm building the curb I'm doing you know the scabbing of the two by sixes in between the studs at the bottom all of that stuff is in preparation for tile all of this is in preparation for tile everything that I do as far as prep goes has an end result which is can I put tile on this and make it look good and make it fit everything in my mind is thinking about tile later on so when some people purport that you know what I'll do all the prep all I want you to do is tile and maybe but more than likely no because you don't know the parameters of what I can do with my tile and what I can't do so more often than not if somebody has said that to me and I've looked at their prep no I can't tile over it All right, this is the buttering that I was talking about. Um, the thin set that I'm using, this, in this case it's gray. And I believe because I think I'm using gray thin set for the entirety of the shower, if I'm not mistaken. So it doesn't really matter the color. Um, if I'm using white thin set, then I'll butter my curb with the white thin set. Either which way, I'm still making you know this whole curb, as I said, kind of monolithic you know all the seams oh and by the way the inside and the outside wallboard go first and then the top cap goes on there and it kind of matters to me in that order but I'm buttering the front I'm buttering the back or the inside as it were and I'm buttering the top and I'm making it nice and smooth as easy so I'm filling in all of those screw holes I'm filling in all the seams where the two backer board meet So, um, you're going to see me do something else here, too, with this mud. Thin set, as it were. Uh, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. So, what you're going to see me do here momentarily. Uh, I'm trying to get my shower um, as waterproof as possible. So that no water ever penetrates my pan material. For that reason alone, I feel like um, through the years I've noticed that Red Guard sticks to different material a different way. And it sticks to thin set a whole lot better than it does my mortar bed. And where the mortar meets up the pan liner, all three si all, sorry, all four sides around, seems to me the Achilles heel. So for that reason, I screed out some of my thin set right up against, and you'll see that momentarily, right up against where the pan liner meets the mortar material, I screed some thin set all four sides around. So that when I finally red guard, I know I have good adhesion of that red guard going up against that area. 
If I have any dips in my shower pan, I screed a little thin set on that. I screed thin set. Oh, ooh, this is very really important. What do I do with my bump outs, Bob? You know, where all my corners are at. I have this bump out material after I've set my shower pan. You know, they're bump out of, of the, the folds in the corner. And so the way that I take care of that is I take off little pieces of, um, of dura rock that I'd wrap my curb with. And you see that I'm pushing it into that void because that void is caused, you know, your mortar is not pushing up against that um, those folds of the corner. But when it dries, yes, you're going to have a loose corner because of the folds of the pan liner. So I'm pushing in dura rock into those voids that are caused, you know, that you can't help. And I just, that's a very, very, <laughs> that's a dull chisel. Trust me on that. I'm not. I'm not cutting any pan liner at that point, but I'm pushing those pieces of dura rock into those voids, and then here I go with the thin set at the perimeter, including where I just pushed in the dura rock in the voids. Funny thing is, sometimes I don't have any dura rock on hand, um, and I have gone outside and I have found pieces of pebble that will fit into those voids perfectly, or if they don't fit in perfectly, I'll just you know, take my hammer and bang a piece of rock up into pieces and I'll stick the pieces of rock in there. Anything to fill that void that then I can go over with thin set and get as close a corner as possible. Possible. Um, the other place, before I interrupted myself, the other place that I screed the thin set is around the drain. Because again, for the same reason, I just feel like the red guard, yes, will stick to the mortar pan. But it sticks a whole lot better with the thin set involved. And so I get my thin set as close to the neck of that drain as I possibly can. And you'll see that momentarily. And once again, it doesn't really matter. You know, the white thin set works just as well. In fact, I like working with the white thin set. I don't know, it seems mm, hardier if that's the correct term. And there is where I'm going right up to the edge of the drain and I'm leaving myself, you know, like no gap whatsoever on the inside portion of that drain with my uh, blade there and pushing the thin set in as far as I can. And then later on in the next video you're going to see where I put a bead of silicone right up against there as well. And then my red guard will overlap onto that silicone so that we don't have any leaks Hey, if you enjoyed that video and you learned something, consider being a Patreon member. Five, ten, fifteen dollars a month would help me greatly produce more videos. I make nothing up from YouTube at all. If you're going to call me for advice, please donate fifty dollars for thirty minutes. My link to my PayPal and my Patreon account is down below. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so you get immediate notifications as soon as I post videos. And thank you very much for your support.